to episode 343 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with... Michael O'Malley. Seth Troyer. And Jessica Carr. In today's episode, we'll be talking about movies that we saw this week in part one. And in part two, we'll be kicking off our food and movie series with 1987's Babette's Feast. Um... Real quickly, uh, we're doing this. If you are watching this on YouTube, welcome. We're going to be live streaming this on our Patreon page as well as Jessica's Patreon page. Um, and then we will have the full episode on YouTube.com slash Cinematary. Uh, and we're going to we're gonna hopefully just keep doing this because, um, I don't know, people seem to listen to the podcast on the, on the old YouTube as well. So uh, I don't yeah, know if you want to see our face. <laughs> It's really weird to think that people will be watching us talking later. I'm just like, mm, I don't know. It feels strange. I can't pick my nose during the podcast anymore. That's what I, I just, I was like, I was like double fist. I know. Yeah, exactly. Usually I got both of them going No more like doing this. that. Um, real quickly though, Jessica, do you want to do a, another very quick plug for the Patreon exclusive for this series? Yes. So if you... Become a patron of Cinematary. You will receive a very cool recipe for pork adobo, which is a, um, fil- it's like a Filipino stew. And I've grown up eating this my whole entire life. It has been a huge hit with my friends. You at home can make this delicious recipe if you pay us $5 <laughs> and continue to pay us $5 every month for the rest of your life until you die. Yeah. So that's how it works. Yeah, but it's really cool. And um, it's like a, I thought it was like a fun little thing to give our patrons like current currently ones that are um patroning us and then also as an incentive to get people to join because we're doing a um food series and zach is having so much fun with these banners on this like live Dude, streaming you guys thing. gotta you gotta go to the live stream we got the banners oh, going man. i'm so pumped but yeah like uh, i'm super excited about it i love food i'm excited to talk to everyone about food and their food experiences so very nice. So yeah, patreon.com slash cinematary. Uh, check it out. And like I said, we're, whenever we record our episodes, we'll be doing the live stream of that and the patrons can watch it as we do it. And we're not going to like, we're just going to continue. So uh, you can hear all of our useless chatter and, you know, silly stuff on the, in the internet. I don't know. That's something you're into. All right, well, let's jump into movies that we saw this week. Um, Michael, I'm going to kick it off with you. You saw one a movie that is technically a new release. Um, it's kind of been floating around the last year, but I know uh, I know it was a big hit on the virtual cinema circuit uh, in 2020. Tell us a little bit about Martin Eden. Yeah, so I saw Martin Eden, which is a French slash Italian, mostly Italian film. Um, Directed by a director whose name I'm sure to mispronounce, although Zach, who took Italian in college, I'm sure can correct me, but Pietro Marcello. Um, Marcello. You got, you got <laughs> Pietro Marcello. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> At any rate. Um, Jessica was impressed. That director, I believe, has mostly done documentary films, and this is one of his first like narrative feature films. Um, and it's based on a Jack London novel. Uh, and if you're like me... You know Jack London because of Call of the Wild and White Fang and all those kind of like boring dog books that they made you read in middle school or maybe as a freshman in high school. And um, I think Jack uh, London is maybe more interesting than I gave him credit for based on this. I've not read the book, um, but this movie had no dogs in it um, and in fact was about um, like this dude um, whose name is Martin Eden. And he, I guess the novel is probably set in the early 1900s when it was written, but this movie, it's it's doing this thing. I feel like a lot of kind of quote unquote period pieces have done recently, which is that they kind of play fast and loose with um, the time period. It actually is a lot like Caravaggio that we talked about on the podcast not too long ago in the sense of like, it confounds being put in a specific time period. Um, So you'll have like the characters walking through like sliding glass doors in a building that are obviously like from the 21st century, 
but also they're like writing letters to one another and acting like characters who are, you know, in the early 1900s. Um, so anyway, uh, the, this character Martin Eden is like a this like kind of poor working class. Uh, I think he's a sailor, um, but he meets this kind of uh, middle class uh, woman that he's like really attracted to. And she says, like, oh, you got to get an education, you know, make your make something of yourself. Um, and so he kind of goes on this, like, quest to, like, become this self-actualized person um, and eventually gets quite a lot of success as a writer. Um, I was reading the Wikipedia page for this uh, and the novel, and apparently, like, Jack London intended this to be, like, a pseudo-autobiographical um, novel about his own success and his... Uh, anxieties about being like so financially successful as an author um when he contrasted that with his like own personal beliefs which uh jack london was a socialist uh which i also didn't know they don't tell you these things when you read call of the wild um and so what what the story uh ends up being is kind of like this like refutation of like the self-made man like um this, there's all these like socialist rallies around this guy and he keeps um, uh, kind of busting into them and like people are like, hey, look, it's this guy, have him make a speech. And he'll make a speech about how individualism is great and people will, like boo him off the stage. Um, and so rather than like take that to heart and think like maybe I should, you know, find solidarity with my fellow working class people, he like burrows deeper and deeper into this idea of like kind of like adopting this like bourgeois mentality um, while at the same time not completely fitting in because he doesn't really like these like really rich people who are like, you know, capitalists and all that. Like he, because he comes from the background where he has seen people be exploited by that, he doesn't really understand it um, uh, or it doesn't really like it. And so he ends up being this kind of like really embittered, like populist figure who is like basically like a libertarian kind of person, like who keeps like espousing the values of like, monarchs and things because they're they're the ones who are in who have total control and um it's a really interesting story um and uh the film itself uh besides the story is really interesting too um it's beautifully shot um it's got this i don't know if this is like a digital filter or something but it's got this really grainy look to it um so it kind of looks like a like 70s italian feature like um like the conformist or something um and then also intercut with um, the, like, uh, actual footage of the film is, like, this, like, uh, I don't know if it's actual stock footage, um, but it's intended to look like stock footage of stuff um, of, like, things from actually the early 20th century as, like, they're, like, interstitial little sequences in which there's, like, these silent sequences where... Um, the stock footage is going and it's really, you can tell like the, the film stock has really been through the ringer because it's like all wavery and there's little like, you know, burn marks and things like that. And it's, it's a really interesting visually, uh, a, a really interesting decision visually that the film makes. And, um, so I, I thought it was really, I thought it was really good. It's, it's a little long. It's like two hours and 15 minutes or something like that, which I felt by the, there's a certain point at which his arc the Martin Eden arc becomes kind of inevitable where like, you're like, okay, I know where this is heading. And it maybe spends a little bit too much time after that point where you're kind of just kind of waiting for the inevitable, like, uh, you know, okay, I can see, you know, where this is going. Let's hurry it up a little bit. But um, for the most part, I thought it was really good and a really interesting movie, both like on the narrative side and also the, the cinematic technique. Um, so I would definitely recommend it if you're someone who's maybe – um, interested in this sort of story or just kind of, you know, has seen the buzz for the film. Uh, I think the buzz is, is warranted. It's, it's a really, it's a really good engaging movie with interesting things to say. I think, uh, dog core. I think Jack London is considered dog core. I think that's. Yeah, this would be a departure for him. Uh, like I said, I don't think there's a single dog in the movie. Um, there's no calls, no wilds, um, it's, uh, it, it, you know, if, if I hadn't seen the based by, on a novel by Jack London, like on the Wikipedia page, I would have never, I would have never guessed. You wouldn't guessed. even know it's dog core. Um, you wouldn't even know. Yeah, like, yeah, the dog lovers might be disappointed. I, I, that might be the, the, one, the one audience 
who might be let down by this uh, departure for Mr. London. Well, there you go. So, good movie, but not for dog movie enthusiasts. Um, a, a group that's consistently left out. So They are fine. It's, it's another... <laughs> Very cool. Um, Jessica, I'm going to toss it over to you. You saw a, what is now, I believe, a Best Picture nominated movie? Yeah, so... Isn't it? Yeah. I'll talk... I have two movies to talk about, but I guess I'll talk about the better movie first. Um, The first movie I'll talk about is um, Sound of Metal, and I'm pulling up the information. It's directed by... We're about to get a log line uh, right here, guys. (laughs) It's uh, directed by Darius Martyr, and it is about a drummer who starts to lose his hearing, and he plays metal music and um the movie like opens with him playing this like hardcore drum set and it is like super loud and in your face and he's like shirtless and sweaty and like covered in tattoos and he's just like playing this drum set and his well you find out later it's his girlfriend who's like screaming into the microphone and they have this metal band and then the movie shows him just like enjoy like a regular day um as he would and then literally the next day when he wakes up he like starts to lose his hearing and he goes to the doctor and finds out that it's irreversible and that he is just gonna have to live with being deaf and the whole entire movie is like kind of him coming to terms with that trying to learn um sign language and trying to figure out like how he's going to adapt to this because the doctor straight up tells him like even if you get a cochlear implant you will never be able to play music again like it's too hard on your ears you can't be a metal drummer when you like have this kind of condition and uh what i really like about the movie is that so you find out that um his character uh i'm trying to find his name it's not loading Zach, I don't know his character, the Riz Ahmed character. Riz, yeah, yeah Riz Ahmed's character. He, um, you find out that he was also addicted to heroin, and he has been sober for four years. And so it's really interesting because the movie kind of parallels like addiction with like finding out that you are also you have a disability and like coming to grips with it and it's really interesting because he finds this um community of people who are also like addicts and who are also deaf and so their like group therapy is coming to terms with the fact that they are disabled, but also the fact that they're trying to overcome an addiction. And I thought that that was like a really, I would never have thought to have paired those things together, but it makes a lot of sense to me because both of them, it reminded me of the serenity prayer of like accepting things that you can't change, and but like moving past them. And when you're disabled, like it's something that you can't, you can't change, you just have to adapt. And when you are an addict and you have that in your past, like that's not something that you can change but you can learn how to live with it and how to move forward and honestly like this movie is a tearjerker like rips your heart out in so many different ways but like the ending is so beautiful and it makes a lot of sense like why it is being nominated for Oscars and I I'm very hopeful that Riz Ahmed will um, hopefully get the Oscar for Best Actor because he, like, kills it in this performance. Um, and Olivia Cook is also in it. Un- She's very unrecognizable because she has blonde eyebrows, like, in the beginning, in the beginning of the um, movie. Like, blonde eyebrows and, like, covered in tattoos, and she's, like, very unrecognizable to me. I, I did not figure out it was her until, like, three-fourths into the movie. I was like, wait a second. Um, 
but yeah, the film is so, it's so good and it handles the subject matter like so tenderly and um, has lots of, lots of um, care and passion put into it. And I would encourage everyone to watch it. Like if you're, if you're one of those people who just like waits until something wins an Oscar and then you watch it, like that sucks. Like you need to, you need to watch it right now because it, it's on Amazon for free, Amazon Prime, you can watch it. Um, so go do nice. that. And the, I think it was also nominated for sound mixing, which like the sound design in the film is also amazing because it, it does this thing where you can, you can feel his hearing like fading in and out and it like switches it and you, you feel like you are him, like you are in his like hearing experience, um, at those parts in the film. So really, really good. Um, the next movie I want to talk about was so disappointing to me that it like straight up pissed me off. <laughs> like, absolutely, it just made me mad. It's it's a anti porno by my my guy Sion Sono, and I love Sion Sono for things like Why Don't You Play in Hell and Tokyo Tribe, and those are movies. Also, Tag, which was like not a bad movie, not his one of his bangers, but still pretty good. Um, like, I, I love this director because he puts so much, like, his movies are so fun, and there are things that he does with them where it's, like, it's repetitive, like, you get these weird things stuck in your head, and, and the actors will, like, have role reversals, but it all plays into this, like, big fun mess that is, like, an adrenaline rush, and anti-porno is not that at all. It is, like... It is like him trying to make a comment on like the porn industry in Japan and how like women are taught to be ashamed of their bodies and like if you have sex with one guy you're all of a sudden a whore but if you like you know shelter yourself then you're a virgin and nobody wants you still because like you have no experience and he but he's like he the the way that he decides to play out this is by having a wo a woman who is playing an actress and she has an assistant and she just screams at her assistant nonstop, like screams at her and is like, take your clothes off. And then like hits her and calls her a dog. And it's like, it's doing all of these like violent things that is supposed to be like, well, this is how directors treat women. Like this is how the industry treats women. But he is also like treating women like that and isn't really saying anything about it. Like. If you're, why are you showing me the same things that are bad and then not doing anything about it? Like, it, it didn't make sense to me, like, as something that was trying to comment on that because he wasn't, like, saying anything that was new or doing anything about it. He was just, like, literally, like, softcore porn is what the movie, like, what the movie is. And I was just, like, so confused and... Like, it it was a hot mess. Like, none of it made sense. It's also his, like, shortest movie that I've ever seen. This thing is only an hour and 18 minutes long, and it felt longer than that. Which is, like, why don't you play in hell, I think, is, like, two and a half hours long. And, yes, you're, like, exhausted by the end of it, but you're, like, that was worth it. And this was, like, I could not wait for this to be over. It was so bad. And I'm just, I just don't know what happened. Like, I, I don't know. He, like, didn't do his research. He didn't, like, talk to a woman and say, hey, what do you think about this? He was like, I know what I'm talking about. I'm just going to write a whole entire movie about it. And, like, the the only reason why I gave this thing, like, two stars, I gave a, a whole entire star to the fact that there's a scene where they just spray paint on somebody. Like, paint just drops out of the sky. And it's, like, so colorful and beautiful. And then they start fucking in the paint. And I was like, why? Why did you, like, ruin? Why did you ruin it? It's bad. It's not good. I don't know... I don't know why he did that. Wait, ruin the moment or ruin the paint? Just it was na it was nasty. All of it was nasty. I have no should the the there was a woman in it that was like puking all the time. Just like she was disgusted with herself because she was a porn actress and she just kept puking. I don't know 
I don't know. It felt very anti-sex work also. Like, I don't, I don't know what he was trying to say. I have no idea. I wish that I did, but I don't. And I think that this is a case of him just not asking a woman, like, what she thought or, like, how she wanted to be represented because... The there's another one of his films tag most of his most of his movies are about male dominance like Tokyo Tribe is literally about like two men feuding about dick size like that is exactly what Tokyo Tribe is about so I don't know it's like and that's great I feel like he knows what he's talking about when it comes to that stuff but he did not know what he's talking about this movie and like tag <laughs> yeah and oh my god and I I think that he can I think that he can approach topics about women correctly like the movie tag is about female like how female characters in video games are like always big breasted and like you know over sexualized and I think that that movie handles that very well but this did not. This is bad. I rent, also I paid $4 to rent this. And I was so, I was so disappointed. Anyways, don't watch this. Watch Sound of Metal. And that's all I, that's all I have to say. So, all right. Is it, is anti-porno streaming anywhere? It, it's on Amazon for $4. So... You could pay four dollars and watch a bunch of hot garbage. That's true. Well, the the highlight is you can come and listen to Jessica tear it down on the live stream where I just put a, a, a ticker on the bottom that said <laughs> Scion Sono sexist question mark. And I'm I love this system so much. Can I just say this? I love it a lot. I, th- I think this is an important part of the live stream is that we explain everything happening on the live stream for the podcast. <laughs> We're like, um, don't give us $5. We'll just tell you what's happening verbally. <laughs> if you were to give us $5, just imagine how great it would this be. Is what it would be like. things. It's incredible. Yeah. All right. Breaking um, news. Seth, Seth, I'm going to toss it over to you. Okay. I saw the movie Blood Beat, and it's, it's just really, really, really off the chain. It's from 1982, directed by Feb... Fabrice, I don't, I'm not going to mess up his name, but, um, he was apparently as high as you would imagine he would have been while writing this and shooting this in 1983 to the point where he's the movie, the name Bloodbeat comes from the fact that like he was so high on drugs that he said that he felt a beat of blood in his ears. Um, that's apparently Seems like it has nothing issue. to do with the plot it just has something to do with his state <laughs> which the plot has a lot to do with his state it feels very like like weirdly Freudian and like let's talk more about that let's unpack that and we never really are able to because it's this crazy crazy like shoestring budget slasher movie with like like scanners level like psychic power stuff it's all about this like uh, this like hippie mom it, it, it's this hippie mom and she's like got psychic powers and can shoot lasers out of her hands and stuff we find out later um, and she's like a artist and her boyfriend is like this redneck guy who shoots deer all the time um, definitely like there are some scenes of like actual like deer getting cut up so just just so you know if you're just be prepared um, but the, uh, boy, her boyfriend is like this weird redneck and I don't know why she's with him, but he's like, always like, I don't know. I don't understand your newfangled ways. I won't, you know, why won't, and he's just mad. Like she, she like doesn't want to sleep with him. And then this is like mirrored with, uh, her daughter or her son's like, well, I think, yeah, I think it's her daughter and her daughter doesn't want to sleep with, uh, her boyfriend who comes for the weekend to hang out at their house and both of these I don't know it, it's really hard to figure out like what he's trying to say in this ridiculous slasher movie with any of that but it eventually comes to the girlfriend does have sex with the boyfriend and 
It's a slasher movie, I mean, yeah. Yes. And, and like, like a slasher movie, it, it has some sort of weird meaning once that happens, crossing of a threshold where her psychic powers are ignited, just like the hippie mom downstairs, and she uses them to animate a, a samurai suit of armor, and it starts chasing everybody around, and they've basically the rest of the movie is trying to escape this samurai warrior. Uh, and you'll have to you'll have to find out if they make it out okay. <laughs> Enough said. I know. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty wild. It's it's definitely just like it has so much like homemade lo-fi like. It feels like people making movies in their backyard in the best way. And I find that, I always find that really exciting with movies. Because it reminds me of making movies in my backyard. When did you say this came out? 83. Oh, okay. But I guess they just came out with like a Blu-ray edition. Well, there you go, guys. The poster, the poster looks crazy. It's nuts. It's such a good poster. Blood yeah, beat. Bloodbeat. Blood <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's bloodbeat. Um, well, real quickly, I want to talk about a collection of. They just uh, put. I think it was a couple months ago on the Criterion Channel. They put a collection of uh, the of works from the avant-garde director, contemporary avant-garde director Sky Hopinka. Um, who is a, uh, he's Native American. He lives in, I think, the Oregon area up in the Pacific Northwest area, or at least a lot of his films um, take place there or are shot there. Um, and the uh, the collection on Criterion Channel, you know, it's it's more of his recent stuff. I think the, the first one was about 2015, and it runs up to 2019. Um, ironically or not, we're, I, you know, we're doing this on Thursday, the 18th. They announced the um, his first feature film. It's going to be coming out uh, next month from Grasshopper Films. Um, but he's a really he's a really interesting director. I've really enjoyed his stuff. The first time I saw uh, one of his films, and this is all Andrew's fault, was at uh, Wavelengths at TIFF. Um, I can't remember if it was the first or the second, uh, but the film. Uh, fainting spells was uh was part of the uh the tiff lineup um but i just wanted to highlight a couple because so his the the slate that they have on criterion there's kind of a nice little mix of different things a lot some of them are kind of more ethereal um he does a lot of like that kind of stan brackage um uh where like the images kind of superimpose on one another um it deals a lot with like folklore and native american lore and um just kind of like this it has this really like interesting dream logic to it i mean you kind of feel like especially in this first one i'm going to talk about you really kind of feel like you're having like this hazy memory as you uh as you walk on this um or you drive on this path um but the first one and i'm just going to butcher the name because like can't pronounce anything. Kunakaga remembers Red Banks. Kunakaga remembers the welcome song. is It's about 10, 10 minutes long. And the majority of it is like, you see a lot of these like um, images of these cars driving. Um, and you kind of have the images kind of, you know, go over one another while also um, talking a little bit about this, this settlement in Wisconsin, the site of... Um, the Europeans um, colonizing in, in what is now Wisconsin. Um, and that's a, what a lot of his work kind of deals with. Like it has this connection to the past. Um, some of his movies, specifically his next one after this one, Wawa, is like conversations with elder members or scholars um, in the Native American community kind of talking in like more in depth about like what the land means to them and what um these kind of spiritual rituals and stuff like the like the meaning behind them and i think that's kind of what i respond to most with with sky Binka's work is that um you know you really kind of get this i i think that it does they do such a, a wonderful job of like bleeding you into the 
location and the land and the nature around you, like while you're, you really just get fully encompassed into the whole um, experience that he's kind of laying out because um, this has been something with that I've kind of had to develop with avant-garde films just in general. But I mean, it's not, those, those aren't movies that you can like sit there and expect to know what, like you can't go in going, well, what's the theme? and trying to like engage with it in that way you kind of at least for me i have to go in and just um try to meet whatever this thing is on its level um and when you do that with his films i think that you really find like this wonderful reverence for like the symbiosis of like us as humans and nature and kind of like um he, he kind of represents that with the with just this these, these images and sat and these sounds like you get a lot of like people walking through um, these 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 uh, natural spaces these forests and thing in these paths and such like that um, you also just kind of get this sense that really that there's really this communal uh, spirituality you know that's something that i'm sure we'll we'll kind of talk about in the in the main movie in this episode but like this kind of community um this community base of spiritualism that this that it's not about you know necessarily um like the myths are there to kind of inform how we're supposed to engage with not only the world around us, but the people around us. Um, he has this really wonderful, one of his, the, one of the films in the collection is this documentary at Standing Rock. Um, and you have these two activists who are kind of the, the kind of narrators, just the people listening, um, or the people talking like during the film. Um, and they're kind of, and they're just talking about like the whole, like what, what it means to kind of be there and struggling with like, the idea that like you have this land that means so much to their community and their people um and like the the dissonance between like the media presence there and um the violence there and just kind of like the whole just everything surrounding it and and, and the kind of complexity of that and like it's really interesting to like see those images see people like all there and like this this kind of communal spirit um and them kind of just like working through that uh you know in the narration um i think after watching through them fainting spells the one that i saw at tiff is probably my favorite it deals a lot with more of like folklore um elements um Specifically, the the myth of uh, the it, it, the of the Indian pipe plant used by the Ho Chunk, uh, Ho Chunk uh, tribe to revive those who have fainted, um, and the way he does it is you have like all of these images of different like trees and landscapes, and he has like this kind of rolling text of the myth being told that kind of goes across the screen. And for me, the experience was really engaging because like you kind of have to give up because at, at one point the like the, the rolling text becomes not impossible to sit there and read but you kind of you like have you're, you're struggling between like seeing these really evocative images um uh, of like the uh, you, you know you'll see this lush forest and you'll see this kind of burnt down forest and people walking through it and, you, and you're like seeing the text going through it and um I don't know. I think that they're, that they're really just these really moving tone poems of films. And I'm really excited to see what he does like with a feature length film, because I think that he um, establishes a sense of, of place through visuals and sound and ambiance um, in a way that I don't see a lot in contemporary directors. Like he just really is, uh, is able to, um, bring the audience into the space in a way that I think um, people who, who are not like engaging with avant-garde cinema on, um, frequently might might kind of go for just because I think there's something really comforting or relaxing just about being in that space. So um, if you have a Criterion channel, uh, you know, check out Sky Opinka's work or I mean, I'm sure it's out there somewhere, whether like on Vimeo or something. Um, but hopefully it'll get out there more when his film uh, premieres in April. Um, but yeah. Zach, do you know what the title of the feature, the upcoming feature is? <sighs> Give me one second and I will tell you as I kill time. Um, so the first, his first feature is uh, 
it's another it's gonna i'm gonna screw it up because it's uh it's you know this other languages and i'm dumb uh malni towards the ocean towards the shore i'm gonna put the i'll put the link in the this has no effect for the uh, people who are who are watching but i'll put it in the chat for you there buddy okay cool um but yeah i'm a big fan of his and um i think it's worth it if you can go and check it out on on criterion please do so um all right well i think that will wrap up part one we're gonna take a quick break and then we will be back with a uh with a giant feast and a bunch of wine and we're gonna talk about babette's feast after this stick with us Hello, Cinematary listeners. This is your favorite Filipino podcaster, Jessica Carr. I'm here to let you know about a couple of things that Cinematary offers that you might not know about. First, if you're a fan of what Cinematary is doing, please consider joining us on Patreon. Remember when we weren't clamoring for your dollars? Well, now we're just clamoring for five of your dollars. So please help us and donate to our Patreon, and then you'll get exclusive content from our staff, including our film theme theory and chill series where a panel takes a piece of theory each month and deconstructs it before diving into whatever topic is on their mind from the past week the five dollars each month is investment in the website and the podcast and it goes solely to paying our writers for the reviews each week so please consider doing it it's only five dollars if you missed an episode of cinematary or a piece of writing we've had you should consider signing up for our free newsletter each sunday we send out a note with the latest podcast episode piece of patreon content and the last two reviews that we've written at cinematary.com it's perfect for those of you who are interested in what's happening and it makes sure that you don't miss a single cinematary review finally the easiest thing that you can do to help us is to please please give us a rating and review on itunes spotify or whatever else you're using to listen to the show this helps us get more eyeballs and ears on the podcast and the website and it helps the people know about cinematary which is really what we're here for so to recap consider donating to our patreon sign up for the free newsletter and give us a rating or review we would really appreciate if you could do these things thank you for listening and now back to the show Two of episode 343 of Cinematary. In this part, we'll be starting our food and movie series with 1987's Babette's Feast, uh, directed by Gabriel Axel from a script by Axel and based on the 1958 story by Isak Denison. Film stars Birgit Fiederspiel, Bodil Kajir, and Stefan Audrin. <laughs> God, I'm sorry, Danish patrons who are yeah, participating. I mean, I already screwed it up during the Mass Mickelson series, so what am I going to do? Um, beautiful, but pi- <laughs> beautiful but pious uh, sisters Martine and Philippa grow to spinsterhood under the wraithful eye of the, their strict pastor father on the forbidding and desolate coast of Yetland. Until one day, Philippa's former suitor sends a Parisian refugee named Babette to serve as the family cook. Babette's lavish celebratory banquet tempts these families' dwindling congregation who abjure such fleshly pleasures as fine foods and wines. Blixen's original story takes place in the Norwegian port town of Bjorkvag, a setting of multicolored wood houses on a long fjord. <laughs> However, when Axel researched locations in Norway, he found the setting was too idyllic and resembled a, quote, beautiful tourist brochure. He shifted the location to the flat, windswept coast of western Jutland and asked his set designer, Sven 
<laughs> I love the I love the video. Sven Wickman to build a small gray village offering very few or no attractions. Marut Church, a plain Romanesque church built around 1250 on a remote seaside cliff near the village of Lundstrup, was used as a backdrop. Axel altered the setting from a ship-filled harbor to fishermen's rowboats on a beach. He said the changes would highlight Blixen's vision of Babette's life in near complete exile. The title character of Babette was initially offered to Catherine Deneuve. Uh, Deneuve was interested in the part, but was concerned because she had been criticized in her past attempts to depart from her usual sophisticated woman roles. When Deneuve deliberated, while Deneuve uh, deliberated for a day, Axel met with French actress Stephanie uh, Audron and Axel. Uh, remembered Audron from her roles in Claude Chabrol's films Violette uh, Nozirier and Paulette en Ah Vinaigre. French man. French, French man. Paulette Ah Vinaigre. Um, when Axel asked Chabrol, her, firm, for her former husband, about Audrin's suitability, uh, Chabrol said Audrin was the archetype for, of Babette. Axel gave the script to Audrin, told her that Deneuve was contemplating the role, and asked her if she might be able to respond before the next day. Audrin called two hours later and said she wanted the role. The following day, Deneuve declined, and she and Audrin was officially cast. The role of the Swedish general, Lorenz Lohenheim, the former suitor of Martine, was accepted by Jarl Kule. That can't be it. And the Swedish court lady by B.B. Anderson. Uh, both had achieved international recognition as two of Igmar Bergman's favorite actors appearing in many of his films. I like this part. The group of elderly villagers was composed of Danish actors, many of whom were well known for their roles in the films of Carl Theodore Dreyer, which awesome. Um, after the film's release, several restaurants around the world offered recreations of the film's menu. Um, in 1988, the New York Times said, Taking a Longish Tale, Babette's Feast from Isaac Dennison's last collection, Anecdotes of Destiny, from 1958, Gabriel Axel has made a very handsome, very literary movie that does justice to the precision of the Dian uh, Dennison prose, the particular particular particularity of her concerns and the ironies that she so amused her. It's going too fast. Um... And in 1988, the LA Times said the delectable Babette's Feast is a fable told with passion, intelligence, and sumptuousness. Although it certainly has a feast at its center, it would be a mistake to think that its tribute is intended only for great cooks. No. It's a deep reverence to all great artists, whether they make books, bowls, or ballets, baskets, quilts, songs, poems, paintings, dot, 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 or films. On that note... Let's talk a little bit about Babette's Feast. Um, Jessica, it's your series. You're going to kick us off. Okay. So I've never seen this movie before. And as the person who curated the series, I wanted to throw in an older movie, number one, and number two, a movie that I've never seen before because I thought that it would, like, spice it up a little bit. And uh, Babette's Feast was... One of the ones that kept popping up, like when you just Google like food movies, like Babette's Feast is on the list almost every single like website that you click on. And also Momali had seen it and I read his review and that kind of sealed the deal a little bit. And then talking to the core group, we decided that it would uh, be in. And I have to say, that I'm so glad that we put it in because I enjoyed it so much and um, I really didn't, I really like wasn't sure, I mean I read the synopsis obviously, but I wasn't sure of like how it was going to come together I just knew that this lady was like gonna cook a feast but I didn't know why or like really what, you know, how the movie was gonna pull all of that together and I think, I think you do have to have a little bit of patience for it because the like climax of the movie is her making the dinner and everything else is kind of just leading up to it and it almost feels the beginning of the movie is setting it up for that but it almost feels like it's not Babette's like movie at all it's the sisters who are it's like from um, their perspective a little bit but also showing these like two male 
two like gentleman suitors that kind of like missed out on their um, opportunities to get with these uh, women and then they grow old and there's lots of regret and then all of a sudden like a French refugee just like shows up at their door because um, like one of the opera singers that was like trying to woo one of the sisters like sends uh, Babette to these two women like for her to seek refuge because her um, husband and her son were killed in France and she has nowhere else to go. So then that's kind of when the movie gets its like speed and actually like becomes much more interesting to me because before that like you're just kind of with these like puritans who are like singing and they're eating like nasty like bread beer soup that yeah. like is disgusting literally looks like diarrhea like i was making the joke <laughs> like and i and the like the best part of the movie is when you start to kind of figure out like it, babette shows up and <laughs> babette shows up and she's like french and she knows about seasoning things and she knows about spices <laughs> and she knows about seasoning things she does she knows about seasoning <laughs> she things people clearly don't though <laughs> they true. they were um they they were showing so like the sisters go to these shut-ins and the the shut-ins are just like that you know it's like a meals on wheels type of situation before you know back in the day and the the women are like cooking at their homes and like bringing them whatever they can afford to bring them and you know it's like bad soup they're making them like <laughs> nasty soup and so babette shows up and she starts to haggle with all the people in town like she gets better prices for fish she gets better ingredients and she saves them money she's like a, a extreme couponer it turns out <laughs> and like saves them lots of money on ingredients and then she also cooks really well and the best it's so sweet because she'll she, whenever the guy gets uh, one of the shut-ins like gets her soup and he starts to he looks at it and he's like this isn't diarrhea soup and just like starts to eat it and he's just starts smiling like he's like oh this is so good he's like <laughs> he's like this uh the soup that she made is like the best soup ever and it's even funny because when babette like leaves to go get the ingredients for the feast like everyone misses her food because she just turns out to be like this way better cook and i i thought that it was um really interesting too because if you look at cuisine from you know like european countries like they british people i'm sorry y'all don't know how to season things like it is like boiled potatoes like irish people boiled potatoes boiled cabbage and then like, in our defense that was the british people's fault <laughs> they took all their food <laughs> and they don't know how to season anything and then babette shows up and she's like I know how to season things. I know about spices, herbs, wines. I know about cheese. I know about all these great things. And then the Puritans are like, this has to be of the devil because we've never eaten anything this delicious in our life. So there's got to be something going on. Um, I, I feel like I've talked too much. But anyways, I... Yeah, I really like the film. I'm sure we'll get into the nitty gritty of what I think that it is trying to say about how food brings us together and kind of like, even if you have differences with somebody, like for them to share their culture with you, to share their food with you is like really a beautiful thing, which I think the movie is also like highlighting. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, let's jump into the kind of bigger things in a second. But um, Michael, Seth, you, do you all have any kind of initial thoughts on Babette's Feast? Uh, I just want to say I watched this movie like five years ago. Whenever I first watched it, it was several years ago. And I had forgotten everything except the feast part. Like I remembered the larger like framework <laughs> of that. But like I had for the titular like, feast. When I was watching this the other day or rewatching it the other day, I was like, who are these suitors? Why am I spending so much time with these people? Like I had totally forgotten about that. Um, Cause by far the most memorable part is like once Beth that shows up in the food, but that's like a, no, I didn't forget the feast. I remembered everything <laughs> but the feast. Or I forgot everything but the feast. Sorry. Uh, 
<laughs> anyway, uh, oh. I, I didn't remember the suitors or anything, and I forgot how long the buildup is, but it really it really pays off. Um, I watched this actually because uh, my pastor at church used this as like an illustration in a sermon, which is like the most like obscure, like deep cut, like pop culture reference I've ever heard a pastor do. And I appreciated that. And uh, it turned out to be a really good movie. Um, uh, <laughs> but uh, I will say uh, I, that soup, Definitely looked like an improvement over the diarrhea soup. Some of her, some of the rest of her feast, though, it's it's really meaty in this way that I, it was really wigging me out uh, into, at times. Uh, and I'm sure that's just a, a cultural thing, but they're like biting in and you can hear like bones crunching and stuff. And uh, some of that I was like, hmm, I don't know how I would have responded to this have, in real life. Have you, have you ever eaten quail before, Michael? No, are you supposed to just crunch through the bones like that? Well, you can't. So, like, quail quail have really tiny bones, but a lot of them can be, like, so thin that it's, like, if you've, if you've eaten um, cartilage before, kind of, like, that sort of uh, consistency. But I don't, whenever I eat roasted quail, like, I don't eat the bones, but you can. Um, yeah. This is, yeah. like, the, the feast scene, which is, like, 30 minutes. It's a really long sequence, but it's definitely, like, amazing. Um, it's also a really, like an audio experience because you're just hearing the bones crunch and people slurping and stuff. And I can imagine that being like, really like, like setting off some people. Uh, cause some of those sounds, I think a lot of people have negative associations with, but I, I think it's great. Um, and like you guys said, we can get into the, the bigger ideas later. Cause I, I have some real, real affection for the big ideas here, but, um, it's good. I was glad I got to rewatch it. Yeah, they could make, like, a whole, like, ASMR video out of the third half of this movie, I think, The Feast. It'd be a lot to handle for some people. But uh, third half. I had, uh, I had seen this, like, I had seen, like, part of this, like, the opening part, and I, I like, like, years ago with, like, a person I was dating at the time, and we just, like, fell asleep, but in a good way. It was, like, you know, just, like, this is very calming and we're gonna fall asleep now but like where's the feast this was talking about um i i really i was and even this time i was kind of like where's the feast but it like all is just setting the table it's just it's like laying it all out <laughs> for the feast like all of the 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 two sisters and all the events that you think are like don't mean anything they they all mean something in the context of the feast itself and i think oh yeah my my, my favorite scene was like because there's like a whole thing like a big plot point is the it the the, the, the like what, what what are they are they protestant yeah i think they're like um they're like Calvinist or Puritan Protestants specifically. Oh, okay. Yeah, then they're like they're like worried about having too much of a good time or something at this like fancy French feast. And there's that scene where they like it's like really like like all the rest of the movie is very like academic and like straight laced as far as cinematography is concerned. And then all of a sudden there's this crazy psychedelic like nightmare that <laughs> one of them has. And yes. it's like like a zoom in on a turtle with smoke swirling around it as it's being like made into turtle soup, and it's just like, it's just like, I'm gonna say like <laughs> the scene where she brings in all the animals she's about to slaughter to make the feast, like that was a little it's so like, intense because they do zoom in and spend a lot of time on this turtle that's just making like turtle noises, and then you're like, uh, that's gonna become soup. It is a little. I bit. think Criterion Criterion could sell a lot more DVDs if they like made a release like psychedelic version of that scene <laughs> on the cover and all everybody would like definitely be like Bobette's feast looks nuts <laughs> and then they would be like where's the feast <laughs> why does it sound like the Arby's look like <laughs> I where's don't the, know where's the meat where's the feast <laughs> it's kind of turning into that uh. yeah where's the beef that's what it is <laughs> but yeah, like the the part where she so I I felt weird about 
Like, whenever she brings in all of the food... So, like, she wins the lottery in France, even though she doesn't live there anymore because her friend, like, keeps renewing her lottery ticket, like, every year. And she wins the lottery and then gets all this money and... Like, Babette decides that she is going to... They're having an anniversary dinner for the pastor that's, like, dead. It's, like, they're the head of their church group thing or whatever. And uh, she decides that she's going to use all of her money to pay for the ingredients for this, like, grand feast. And the thing about, uh, the thing about it is that they were, like, you know, worried that it was going to be satanic because of all all the the animals that she was bringing in and that she was cooking, they automatically were like, well, this is going to be like a witch's brew. Like, they were like, this is like witch's Sabbath up in here. Like, she's bringing in all these animals that we've never seen and she's going to kill them and we have to eat them and this is like not of the Lord. And so what we are, and so they like make a pact that they're not going to talk about the dinner at all. And I couldn't I couldn't figure out if they were doing that because of A, they didn't want to indulge in it because, you know, like earthly flesh, you're not supposed to indulge in things. Or if B, they didn't want to hurt her feelings. Like they were afraid that it was going to be disgusting and they didn't want to say anything because like the tongue gets you in trouble. And so they didn't want to like hurt her feelings. I couldn't decide if it was like both or one or the other. So what do you, what did you guys think? I think it's more the first one where they're, because their whole, their whole belief system seems to be, I think maybe like out of necessity, given like where they live, which as Zach pointed out in the intro, just looks like barren. You know, it looks like they're living on like a rocky fjord or something. Uh, And so like their whole community is based on like this kind of austerity because they don't, they don't have luxury um, and that seems to have been like ingrained in their beliefs as well, like this suspicion of luxury. You know, they live such simple lives that um, there is a sort of like sensuality that like they seem to mistrust. Um, and I think that, I mean, that's pretty typical for Christianity, maybe not to the degree that this movie and this community does, but like I think in Christian thought like a lot of Christian thought there is like a real suspicion of like the flesh like you said um and whether that be like because of sex or because of like you know um you know luxury or gluttony or any of that sort of stuff like that's definitely the vibe that I got from this community is that they were afraid of like indulging in carnal pleasures that may lead them to like sin because it's so like luxurious and their minds are supposed to be on like spiritual heavenly things rather than you know, indulging in the pleasures of the world. Um, that's kind of what I, the vibe I got. I felt it was like there was such a good, like, illustration of, like, how things actually work with their community. Like, the fact that they are, like, absolutely, like, having their minds blown by, like, what they are eating, and you can tell they're just beaming, like... And stuff, but they are what what they're saying, like that they're like forcefully ignoring it or something. They're like, so it's like proof that a lot of like what they do from a like as from a, from an outside looking in perspective is just sort of put on, and it's sort of like going. They have to go through the motions. They have to do certain things, but they do have this inner life that does sort of like. It, it oozes out at certain moments and that's that was like a moment where it definitely oozes out and they're like I'm, I'm sorry brother I had never meant to be mean to you uh, and that's basically their, the, the only way they can really like allow themselves to like rather than saying like this shit is really good they like can only uh, express that through like Hey, I, I'm sorry about what I did to you last year or whatever. I think, like, I really love that feast scene for a lot of reasons. Um, but, like, Seth, you're kind of getting at one of the things that I, like, really love about it. And it connects to, like, the bigger ideas that I think are really powerful in the movie. Which is that, like, because they make that pact that they can't talk about how good the food is in that scene. Um, and they instead, like, talk about, like, like... Uh, you know, the whole thing is supposed to be remembering the the founder of their community and 
thinking about his teachings and their spiritual ideas. You know, that's the whole occasion for the feast, sort of. Um, and since they can't talk about the food, they have to express how they feel about the food in ways, like they just talk in ways that they would normally talk in their community. But like, that's the moment in which like, the materiality of like their their lives intersects with like their spiritual um, ideas. So like, you know, you could say like, yeah, this shit's really good. And that would be like a purely material like statement. Or you could say something like, you know, wow, the Bible says this, you know, they like quote Bible verses at different times. But like when their pact forces them to replace like, or not to replace, but find that it's like their spiritual things and their, their material things become synonymous in that one scene because they have made this weird artificial pact so that they can't express like material pleasure or spiritual things in the normal way that they would do it. Like instead when, when they think when something is really beautiful and good that they're experiencing, they have to express it in a spiritual way. And I think that that's like super meaningful because like, um, I feel like the, the shortcoming of that like Christian idea that I was talking about where like you're supposed to be suspicious of the flesh or whatever, is that like, uh, it, it's like a false dichotomy, right? Like, you know, your spirit is not separate from your body, uh, nor is like, you know, any, any of your beliefs, you know, we're only experiencing beliefs, uh, through, um, we're only experiencing beliefs through like the material world. And so like to separate those things causes like, you know, these weird, um, uh, contrasts and tensions and that feast dissolves those tensions. And so like, they feel this like renewed sense of community, this renewed sense of like, uh, fraternity among each other. Um, and this like renewed sense of like, uh, like spiritual wonder as well. You know, they exit the feast and like some of them are like looking up into the sky and thinking about like, you know, uh, you know, grander thoughts and like, you know, they, they feel knit together and connected. And I feel like when, when belief is separated from like, uh, your, your like embodied experiences, like, like food or, or, you know, sight or, you know, whatever, um, that can, that, that creates like a sort of impoverished, uh, spirituality and like the true, like, uh, like the true depth of, of, you know, a spiritual experience is when spirit and, and, and matter are synonymous, not when they're separated. And I think that that feast is like really a beautiful illustration of that. But anyway, that's like my, that's my, my take on the feast. No, it was really good. I, I felt bad even doing like a banner during it, you know, I didn't want to mess it up. <laughs> oh my it was gosh. breaking news. <laughs> Too serious. Yeah. I'm glad it was banner worthy though. Too serious for a banner. <laughs> no, I, I like that they that they were so like uh, like elated and just like spiritually fulfilled at the end of the dinner that they were just like let's all just like drunkenly grasp hands and dance oh. around the uh, well <laughs> yes. for a bit and uh, uh, no. Oh my gosh, that reminded me of uh, how how the Grinch <laughs> on Christmas. I was like, they're like the who's. They're like the who's just like Fahu Boris, Fahu Boris, whatever, like around the little well. They let that that cut the roast beast. No, but I think <laughs> I think you hit on something that's that's uh, was like what was so effective about this movie, Michael, because it isn't really about like it's it's and and Jessica, you know, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this. It's it is like to an extent like a food porn movie where like the food itself looks really really good. But it's not necessarily like it's one of those things. The act of eating is not. It's not. That's not what it's about. It's not, like that's that's not like in essence what it's about. Because like you were describing, when they're having these like conversations and this banter during the dinner, like it's honestly that was so hilarious because this <laughs> this dude this this general is just like guys, are you like eating this? this yeah. Is, and amazing like this is so great <laughs> I and yeah, they're yeah. just like our pastor used to say that god brings gifts and he's just like what are you talking about this wine is incredible um I'm about but to, it's i'm about to make a speech yeah. right now yeah but it's but it's constantly um you know like like it's just it's mainly about like this uh kind of like viewing 
whether it's whether it's eating or it's art or it's it's what have you just kind of any sort of creative passion like uh engaging with that on a level that's outside of kind of the more tangible qualities of of you know the group because a lot of the movie when it comes to this um church group is it's like them singing um singing songs or reading bible verses or just kind of talking and it's much more like the the kind of tactile daily um grind i guess is the maybe not the best word but just like of of like the you know of the you know of their faith and it's like in this moment they're kind of engaging with like this more ethereal level of of spirituality that i think um is much more it's, it's kind of like what the basis of what they believe is and it's almost like engaging with that to them like it like it's almost this epiphany to them like how they're kind of tapping into that level after pretend like feeling like they were so deeply engaged with their faith for so long um yeah i i also find that um people are usually afraid of what they don't understand and so um the the parts where they were all just like like her having nightmares about the turtle and like all the weird ingredients that were like in the food it um it kind of reminded me like a lot of the movie to me like i was kind of like viewing it from uh babette's perspective because um like growing up as a filipino american as like one of one of only a few asian like students at school i would pack like very weird lunches like my mom would make me like chicken curry and it would be green and all the other kids would like point at it and be like ew like your chicken is rotten why are you eating it and it was a lot of like them not understanding like how amazing and how delicious it was and it being kind of like outside of their purview which is kind of how these like puritans were like they had never seen anything like this before and only my my whole thing is like you have to experience it like it's a it's a world opening type of experience and i let you know the kids at school taste my lunch and they loved it and they were like stopped making fun of me after that and i feel like these uh puritans like ate babette's food and they stopped you know fearing it because it was something they got to experience firsthand and I thought that that part of the movie was really beautiful and also to like to Zach's point I also like uh, this movie as I think it's more of like a modern take on religion and Christianity of how like I personally like believe that God gives us these like gifts like cooking or like making art or making music because we can share them with others and it is like something that we can give to the world that is good and I you know it doesn't have to be anything related to religion to be able to show someone God's light or God's peace or any of the things that we are supposed to like show to others and share with others and I think that um my partner made like a really interesting point about this movie is that it's kind of like the witch but like reverse like it's like the opposite because because at the end of the witch you're like rooting for her to choose the side of the devil because that's the only way that she'll get to indulge in the things that she wants to like yeah <laughs> Yeah, exactly. She can live deliciously. So she, but mm -hmm. yeah, oh. but in Babette's feast, Double feature. like Babette shows these Puritans that like you can live deliciously in a religious way. Like you can still love God, but also like uh, indulge in these things that He is like allowing people to do, like giving people the gift to cook or giving people the gift of creating art. And these are things that we can all enjoy because God, you know, would want us to do that. And so... And, that, and like you experience God through that too. Like it's not just like this is something on the side. Like I think the movie like show part of their epiphany is that like they realize that this is not of the devil. Like this is of God. And when we were experiencing, you know, when we we're, you know, crunching down on this quail bone, um, like we we are experiencing something that we had only experienced through like our like kind of liturgical practices before this you know this is bringing us together as a community in the same way that like 
church has and maybe even in a different and more profound way. Well, and, and it's, I think also, you know, on a more, like on a more secular level, like it, it there's like a, a bit of a kind of a class uh, angle to this as well, because like, as it's revealed at the end of the movie, Babette talks about how she was a chef at a, at a big restaurant in Paris. Um, and that the meal that she, you know, cooked for them was a meal at that place for 12 people, which is 10,000 francs. And so it wasn't like, it was kind of like, it, it's not something that people, a lot of people would have access to, you know? And so it, like I was thinking about, I've probably, there's, there's been two instances where because of, of just my connections and, and, you know, through media, I've been able to take part in, um, what, like a nice dinner at the, uh, food and wine festival here in town and that's you know it's like incredible wine and incredible food and they like bring the different courses to you um and it's something that you know i don't think a lot of people get to experience not because they're not maybe interested in it but because they don't really have access to it they don't have like the money to be able to pay for like that type of experience and, and to me I was also thinking about like it's probably something profound and special to these people because they are in like this very isolated place it's not like they were like oh well there's this stuff in Paris we could have it but we're just going to ignore it it was like no we just had no concept that this was available and so there was a little bit of like that kind of class access um, level to it that I found, I found also because I think with food unless you you can cook it yourself um you know not a lot of people get to experience like because you think of you think about like the feast outside of just the food she's also like working that room like she's going give them this wine at this point leave the bottle with him at this point you know like she's completely it's all about like the ambiance and the experience as well and i don't think a lot of people like have access to that because they can't afford it and so there was something really moving to me about that where she you know gave them this once in a lifetime experience that might be um you know something you know common for an affluent person in paris but is something that kind of life-changing and life-affirming for this group of people well it's worth pointing out like when she wins the lottery the community assumes that she's going to use that money to move back to to france um but she instead uses it to make this feast and it's revealed at the end of the movie that she used like the whole watering money for the for the feast and like has decided like this was worth more than going back to my old life as a chef in paris um and that's like really moving on on kind of like a, another level to that which is that like babette like views like giving people access to this like one-time experience as more important than like whatever she could have used to change her life circumstances with that money, I guess. Yeah, you also get the feeling that like, while it is like a one of a kind like dinner that they have, it is like, you, you hope that maybe something is learned from this that just like, even just a little something or like a, like making the the real thing is like, yes, the food is, like, bonkers great, but it's, like, it's about the ex the emphasis on experience um, of, the, like, this, we, we can go through different things together and experience different things together. Um, it, is, it is, I think, like, really, like, what what is essential about the whole feast aspect and it doesn't have to be the same dish of soup every time. So do we do we talk about right. the food specifically in this? Because I would like to. No, you lead lead the way with that. So Go she it, the thing that is so like Zach touched on this, but like when you are having like a dinner experience, you like the ambiance matters, like table setting matters. It's like about everything it's like an orchestra it's like everything everyone's like playing their instrument correctly at the same time and it is like comes together to be this like beautiful experience to the person and the movie like uh shows babette just sweating like in the kitchen like preparing all of these things by hand and it just like 
was blowing my mind because to think of like the equipment that she had at the time and how now when you're a, when you're cooking like you can just buy a chicken at the store and you don't really like have to do all this prep but she like had those she had like a whole entire cage of quails that she had to like pluck the feathers from individually and like go through that entire process so it's like even more of a labor of love than it is now and she was preparing a like puff pastry to put with the quail which is like the little uh nest that the quail was like sitting in and she put I'm assuming like frog is what she put um in the middle of the quail stuffed it with truffle and then wrapped it and then roasted it uh, with the puff pastry but like puff pastry is layered and so you have to like you have to laminate it with butter and so these are all things that she had to do like by hand with no refrigerator or anything that was like helping her with the process and I was like screaming like I was just like (laughs) every time a dish came out like my uh partner was like making fun of me sort of because he said that it was like the like um marketing for Avengers Endgame where they would show the the cam in the theaters and at the climax and people were like woo like whenever they were like uh in action and I was just like (laughs) whooping and like hooting and hollering like every time yes it looked everything just looks so good and like (laughs) like I don't know if you guys have ever eaten roasted quail but you should definitely try it at some point but like quail is different from chicken because it is like so they're small so every piece of it is like so succulent like every the meat it isn't like dark meat white meat it's like the whole thing is like so just juicy and delicious and when the skin of a quail is roasted it is like crispy and has like the right amount of fat with the meat and she had like and she had like some sauce and like it was like in like a like a crust or something the puff pastry that was the puff pastry um yeah yeah and she had it in there and it was great i did question the inclusion of the head of the quail because i was confused about that but if you it is common in many places to suck the head of whatever you were eating like if you're eating roasted fish you suck the head of the fish if you're <laughs> it, it is it's a, there's lots Jessica of flavor place. in the oh head and when you roast it with its juices like that is like a delicacy like that is one of the best parts of the dish when you get to it and i think the general <laughs> just no take that banner off <laughs> no. anyways so yeah the general yeah, the went general, right like, for knew you knew know. what he was doing, which is also like touches on Zach's point of like being a class thing because it's obvious this guy has had this meal before. Like he has eaten this dish before, literally served by the, the cooked by the same person. And so he knows how to approach the meal, whereas these other people it would seem foreign to them and they don't really know how to do it. I would but, I do want to point out like how nicely the scene is structured because like you get um as you'll get usually like a shot of Babette preparing the meal in like a portion of the meal in the kitchen. And she's got a couple of people helping. One is this old dude who's just having the time of his life, like grinding <laughs> spices and stuff like that and drinking wine. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, it's the carriage driver. Yeah, for yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. the yeah. secondly is her nephew who looks like <laughs> Linguini from such Ratatouille. A good time. <laughs> like I literally had to Google like, is Ratatouille's Linguini inspired by the guy in Babette's feast? I couldn't find anything. But anyway, like... <laughs> At, no. at the um, you so you'll see a scene of that, and then she'll instruct the linguini guy on like here's what you need to do, and then it'll switch to in the dining room where the linguini guy comes and gives the food, and then the general will explain the food. He'll be like, "Wow, this is etc. etc. etc." And so like, it's for someone like me who's not like uh, you know super familiar with fine dining of that caliber. Like, it's also really, it makes the scene really accessible because you don't have to, like, guess, like, why is this important or, like, you know, what are these things? Like, it, the movie is, like, really opens a nice door for you to understand a little bit of what's going on culinarily um, because it, like, really walks you through step by step. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And the like cherry on top was the beautiful pound cake 
that as a baker, I was like going nuts. I was like, this cake looks so good. It was like, it was like a pound cake with like probably some sort of like a brandy syrup and like little candied fruits around it and like cream on top. Oh my gosh. I was like drooling. The dessert looked so good. Imagine like, just think of like, I want like a quick short of the day after where they're just going back to their normal food and they're just like, (laughs) (laughs) yeah. Yeah, like, can you imagine going scene. back? To, yeah, like a post credit scene where where they're eating their bread ale, you know, mush <laughs> diarrhea soup, and they're just like, remember that time where we were gonna, where we all collectively got together and we're like, don't worry, we won't talk about the food, and then it blew our minds, and now now we're uh, back to yeah. being fish. Can they I, tasted they tasted the fruit, the forbidden fruit. Which can I, can I, side tangent, I loved that they had a, they had to have a powwow where they were like guys all right listen so Babette's going a little <laughs> <laughs> she's gonna cook this thing i don't know what the hell's coming through just pretend like don't even talk about it just eat the food don't talk about it and uh we'll get through this you know we'll get through they had like a whole and everybody's like guys don't worry we won't say anything and like i was like who are you gonna say anything to you're the whole town <laughs> Where's the rest of the town? Like, who are are you gonna go to a visiting town? They're gonna be like, hey, I heard that you had a feast there. I don't don't know anything about that. Like, what? I didn't have fun. I didn't have fun. (laughs) Yeah. Like, who are you gonna talk to? There's eight people in the entire town. They're all over the age of sixty. Like, (laughs) it's God. Yeah. Yeah, They forgot. They need to re. How are they gonna populate? How are they gonna repopulate that town? Well, let me tell you, that one couple's gonna repopulate that night because. That was so funny. When they kissed, I was like, her food is so good that these, like, Puritans are just, like, smooching each other. (laughs) They're getting horny. I was like, yo, that's what's up. That's the power of food, baby. That's the power of Babette. Um, Any last thoughts before we wrap up? Uh, What, like, one of the big overarching things is, like, so so much of this is, like, this movie is, like, kind of, like, lame mom lessons but like packaged in the most beautiful like eloquent way like like i think like one of the biggest things about this is like that like the beginning seems like out of place and that like like we're we're seeing just like how like choices are made in these uh sisters lives and like like and like some people like sh- they stay they stay home and they, they they like live this boring life you know at least as far as we can see and then other people go forth and like they they we they they have like delusions of grandeur and like like the the opera singer guy like things go downhill for him and it's all up and down and it's like it's like proof that these like big choices that seem like a big deal in a in a movie sense and it from your like day-to-day life sense are not like quite quite often they're almost like eclipsed by these like little moments like a dinner or like these little like trans transcendent like moments with like you and another person or just like that one night we had that was like a really good time and we I, I don't even remember what we talked about but it was like it was like a big deal um, I, I just I just felt that real hard here. Yeah, it's it's a it's a movie that's um, that, like I I think really uh, nails down like it's it's just a really comforting movie. You know, like there there's really not a part <laughs> that's like stressful or bad. Like the you know like you, you mentioned at the, at the top, Jessica, that like it, it it's a little draggy when you go through like the kind of backstory to a degree of the two sisters um because you're not totally sure what's going on. You're like, yeah, I like I know there's going to be a feast and now um this chick's making out with this general and then this this singer guy's trying to hit on this other sister and like all that stuff's kind of happening. Um but then it really does like zero in on I think because I think that that, um, you know, for a movie that's under two hours, it's able to kind of capture like all of these lives. Like, I feel like especially the two sisters and the the general character in Babette, like you feel like you got a full picture of who they are as people in their lives. Um, And I think that that's just kind of the I think that the the filmmaking really just um, the way that 
that there was this one this one sequence i think it was the the pastry you were talking about jessica where she like has the pan and like flips it and you have like the the plain pastry and then it has like the the cross cut and then but it stays in the same place and it like just fills out with all the little things on it that was a fucking edit right there it was great um (laughs) I don't know where I was going. That was great. It, the movie is the movie's fantastic. I also like as well that it has like a random like out of left field like surrealist moment where Babette's just like I'm making my food and those people are flipping the hell out that she's gonna make this amazing meal. <laughs> I think it's good. I'm gonna go. Mm-hmm. I'm probably not gonna get it's to eat quail things. anytime soon, but I would like to eat quail soon. But no. Yeah. Jessica, is there like? Is there a particular piece of food? I mean, you talked about a lot of the food through this, but is there like a particular piece of food that's prepared in this movie that like you feel like, wow, like that's like the the like culinary climax of of like what I'm interested in in this movie? Oh, it's definitely the quail. I mean, it's definitely the quail. That's the center point of the dinner and that is that is even the scene where the general realizes that he knows who the cook is um because he starts to describe it and how how he's never eaten anything so delicious in his life and that he knows that there is only one chef that could have possibly made this because there is like he's eaten it before and the way that it's prepared is so specific that he is like i'm pretty certain that this is who this is and kind of is looking around for a confirmation that that's true. And everyone's like, ah, we love Jesus. We love God. So, (laughs) and he's like, okay. (laughs) And he, and he's like, oh, okay. Well, whatever. Um, (laughs) But yeah. Jesus is pretty great. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That guy had a night. That guy just had a, (laughs) <laughs> he, he he reconnected with his lost love and all these people are just talking about Jesus around him. He's like, are you like eating this meal? Yeah, right now? so um, there's, there's a lot of preparation that went into that one specifically. And so I think that that would probably be the like centerpiece of the dinner. Um, well, Babette's Feast, I, I, I recommend for me as well. It's on uh, HBO Max as well as the Criterion Channel. So, you know, or rent it at your local library. Check it out. I think it's a, it's a nice, I mean, I would eat first because I felt like such, I mean, I watched this movie and then I was like, all right, let me go warm up some fucking pizza to eat for lunch. You know, like <laughs> it was such a, it was such a down, Man. you know, downer afterwards. Yes, yeah, so I was really sad um, moving on to ramen, like just my basic ramen right? after that. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay. Well, let me just eat this, I guess. Um, all right, well, that will wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary, on Twitter and Instagram at handle at cinematary, and on Letterbox at letterbox.com slash cinematary, where we post all the movies that we talked about in this episode. I guess go to youtube.com slash cinematary to check out the, uh, if you did not watch the live stream, but you want to watch the, uh, the video version. It's here. It's been fun. I've had a lot of banners. I've entertained people. I made. <laughs> the, sometimes the banners were bad and said bad things, but it's fine. I, I did a direct quote. I don't know what to tell you. Um, but but if you want to watch in the future, if you would like to watch these live streams, you can go to uh, patreon.com slash cinematary and support us. Thank you to our patrons, Cam, Chad Newsom, Christina Daughtry, Corey Willingham, Harry Eskin, Candace Sisson, Maggie, Ron Hayes, Titus Arthur, Tyler Chandler, and Whitney Rhea Ross. Thank you so much for your patronage. Next week, we will be continuing our food and movies series with 2007's Ratatouille, which... Oh, yeah. It's a Starring the nephew so from... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Starring the nephew His from the best Feast. Yes. The Bad oh. Bad Feast Cinematic Universe. Yeah. Ratatouille is going to be so fun. I don't have a chef's hat, so... It'll still be fun though. I, I I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna it's gonna be a good one. Nathan's gonna be on the episode. He said he's excited to be on the rat movie, so whatever that means. Um, all right. Well thank you guys for listening and watching, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>